What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. Big O's gotta eat fantasy football. As always, it's your boy Nicholas. Week three is in the books. I started writing my notes, right, for week four. A murky running back situation kind of notepad, whatever. I was looking at stats and stuff, and I realized there's like 15 teams that have ridiculous running back situations where it's impossible to decipher right now, right, for the average fantasy football player. So I'm like, this is gonna take up a whole 30 minutes by itself, so I figured why not just make a sheet that I can email out to you guys each week, kind of breaking down the running back situation from the previous week, right? Stats from week three, looking towards week four, the snap percentage you guys, uh, each running back had, carries, total yards, total touches, all that kind of stuff. Come on, Steve, relax. That's what I'll be doing today. I also wanna say one thing. Listen, throughout the course of the season, I'm gonna get thousands of questions, dude. And I'm gonna be wrong on a ton of them. If you're someone that goes, like you take my analysis, right? And you use it for your lineups, you use it for making trades, you use it for whatever, that's great. But I am not gonna be right on everything I say. It's your job to kind of break down my analysis, but also look at other people's analysis, right? And maybe this week in my weekly video, I'll, I'll list maybe like five or 10 of the top Twitter accounts to follow when, you, when you're talking about like fantasy football analysts. Cause you gotta get different viewpoints. You gotta get my point of view, you wanna get maybe like Evan Silva's, Matt Berry's, Brad Evans, Ray, whatever his name, I don't know, all the Roto World guys, right? Everyone has different points of view and other stats might stick with you more so than maybe something I give you. So if you disagree with me, there's a good chance that you, maybe you're right and I'm wrong. So don't take what I say word for word. Like I'm gonna be wrong on plenty of shit this year. I make terrible sit-start choices on my own teams. I'll do the same for you guys. So if you're asking for my opinion, take it as an opinion, take it with a grain of salt, but go do your research elsewhere as well. And make sure if you enjoyed the video, this video, you give it a thumbs up. I would love you for that. But I'm gonna show you exactly what I want you to do for this video, especially if you're at a desktop right now. So let's get into it. So here's what I want you to do right now. If you're at your computer, hopefully you're at your computer, this will work a lot better if you're at your desktop. It doesn't really come in great over mobile, but go to my website, bdgeat.com. You can see the URL right there. Stay on the homepage. I want you to scroll down, put your info into here. If you're not already subscribed to the newsletter, I'll send out every Tuesday when the waiver wire sheet drops because that's only in blog form. That's not video. And I'll also send out an email when this sheet drops, the, uh, the running back kind of situation sheet goes into the blog. So fill that stuff out. You'll be added to the mailing list and I'll, you'll automatically get those two emails every week when it comes out along with whatever kind of stuff I um, I send out throughout the season. After you do that, go to the top menu, hit blog, and you can click on this first blog post. And this is the chart I'm going to be using. So you could see it has everything from the teams, the running backs, the snaps, carries, all the statistics from last game that you might be able to find around the internet, but I kind of compile them for you to let you know like who's playing, who's getting the most touches who's doing well fantasy wise along with a bunch of notes that I'm gonna have at the bottom it's kind of just like one note for each for each team depending on you know like what I've seen throughout the first three weeks of the season what I kind of think going forward and you guys can kind of look at the chart what you want and make make of it what you want so this will be here and I'm not sure if I'm gonna be doing this every week like I don't know if I'm gonna be making the chart for you guys every week and I'll put it out on the blog so make sure you are subscribed to the newsletter but I'm not sure if I'm going to be doing a video for it every week maybe every three weeks all right so let's dive into the chart and this is up on my site right now so you can go look at it and follow along if you want I'm just gonna go backfield by backfield and break down what I what I see and, and things that I'm looking at. So I saw with the Chicago Bears, a, a huge bounce back game for Jordan Howard. I was completely off him this week, right? I probably told a lot of people to sit him, so my bad on that. Look at Tariq Cohen. He's got at least 13 touches, four receptions, and 66 total yards in all three games the Bears have played so far. He's played in only 8% less of the Bears' snaps this year than Jordan Howard has. Tariq Cohen, as of week three's games being finished he has one less rush attempt and two more catches than christian mccaffrey so far this year and he currently leads all running backs in both targets and reception and he's tied for fifth overall in the entire league wide receivers tight ends running backs all skilled players in receptions with 25. So only four guys are ahead of him in total receptions on the year. So despite Jordan Howard's bounce back game, we knew that he was the guy in, in standard leagues, right? Cohen is still a really, really nice floor play in PPR leagues and probably a locked in low end RB2 going forward for PPR leagues. Moving over to the Brown situation, man, I was high on Isaiah Crowell coming into this game. And I was saying, you know, if there's a game that he's gonna do it, it's gonna be this game against the Colts, not a great run defense. They're gonna be in the game for the most part, so we should see a lot of running opportunities 
and I guess that didn't really happen. I'm, I'm probably going to go out and say that Crowell is no longer really a buy low target. If he wasn't getting it done in this game, he's probably not really going to get it done as anything more than like an RB3 flex play going forward. So stats I uh, took away from, from what we have on Crowell. He has 39 carries on the year. According to Pro Football Focus, Crowell has avoided just one tackle. Duke Johnson, on the other hand, has six carries on the year, and he's avoided two. So he's gotten about 15% of the carries that Crowell's got this year, but he's got double the avoided tackles. So like elusiveness, basically. Last season, Crowell caught 40 passes on the year. So far in 2017, through three games, he's only caught four balls. When you pace that out to 16 games, that's gonna give him right around 21 receptions. So almost like half the amount of receptions Crowell had last year, he's on pace for this year. Duke, on the other hand, has 17 targets already through three games. That would pace him out to 91 targets. I'd be surprised if he actually hit that number, but last year he only had 68 targets. So it looks like it's an uptick. However, though, he only has six carries through the first three games, right? And that puts him on pace for 32 carries on the year. Last year he had 73 carries on the year. The big difference I see here, the big thing to take away, Duke Johnson's average depth of target last year was 1.9. So 1.9 yards down the field. This year it's at 8.6. And I think that's a lot to do with the way they're using him in the offense, right? They're also putting him in the same time Crowell's in. They're lining him up in the slot, lining him up at wide receiver. They didn't do it a ton last year. So now that he's lining up, you know, on the line of scrimmage, his, his targets are, are a lot farther down the field. They're not just dump off behind the line of scrimmage. So that's a big, you know, 8.6 depth of target compared to 1.9 last year is a huge jump. And that's going to be big in, in fantasy. We also look at Crowell last season. He had 18 carries inside the opponent's 10-yard line. Right, so that's like in scoring position. So far this year, through three games, he has one. Deshaun Kaiser, their quarterback, the mobile quarterback, has three rushing attempts already inside the opponent's five yard line. So things are just not going well for Crowell. I feel like I could play something off that. I could spin something not well for Crowell. Someone think of something witty to put in the comment section there. I mean, still, Crowell has out-touched Duke Johnson 43 to 17, but Duke's out-produced him in yardage 204 to 159. So I would say, I mean, Duke should get more uh, touches going forward, you know, as a running back and as a receiver. It's interesting to look at their their uh, their snap split. If you look at the chart, Duke Johnson's actually taken the lead on snaps. He's, he's been in for 58% of their plays while Crowell's only 56% of their plays. So Duke Johnson is probably becoming the back to own in Cleveland. Move to Detroit. Abdullah has seen 17 touches so far or more, at least 17 touches in all three games so far this season. And he has just 32 less receiving yards than Theo Riddick on 11 less targets. But Abdullah, like a lot of people thought coming into the season, his touchdown total was going to be very low or his scoring potential was going to be low, right? And he hasn't scored a touchdown yet this year. He hasn't scored since week one of 2016. So going forward, I mean, Abdullah, while he's getting the workload, he's just not seeing enough scoring opportunities there. So it's it's kind of a knockdown on, on where we're seeing Abdullah. New England, man, backfield still very shaky as, you know, you could basically predicted preseason, could have predicted four years ago. Despite Brady throwing for 378 yards this game, this last game, and five touchdowns, touchdowns. We didn't have a single running back on the team with more than 3.3 fantasy points and half point PPR. Mike Gillisley is a yet to be targeted in 2017. So he is absolutely that LeGarrette Blunt role. They're going to have games where it means nothing. And even James White without Rex Burkhead got nothing going in this game. So it's a little scary to see as someone who owns Gillisley. And I started, I started both guys. I, did I start Gillisley? I know I started James White. I'm not sure if I started Gillisley in my flex in the E-Town get down, but it's kind of scary as a, as a New England back owner that, again, you know, it's just it's just what we knew. They're, they're going to be on and off every game. Moving over to Houston. We don't have a single running back in Houston in the Texans' backfield that has a goal line attempt or a goal line reception on the year so far. Mar Miller over the last two weeks has been in on 70% of the Texans' snaps, while Dante Foreman is only in on 23%. And Tyler Irvin is actually playing more than Foreman is. Uh, he's been in on 25 percent of the team's snaps. Now, Miller is more than double the amount of PPR fantasy points that Foreman does. Foreman has 15 to Lamar Miller's 31, but Foreman is producing more than double the amount of fantasy points per snap than Lamar Miller is. Foreman's at 0.43 fantasy points per snap, and Lamar Miller is only at 0.21. So on an efficiency level, Foreman's the better fantasy running back. We just don't know if he's going to get the volume. He's, you know, he's put up a few big plays through the passing game, which it's hard to keep up that efficiency. Either way, none of these guys, neither of these guys are getting any kind of 
touchdown upside or touchdown opportunity here. So that's something to be a little bit nervous about. Miller's still getting a lot of play time, a lot of touches, but he's almost like, it's almost like Amir Abdullah. I mean, you can't look at either of these guys as more than a low end RB2 flex kind of play. And for, I wouldn't even put Foreman there, but Lamar Miller is probably a low end RB2 at best right now. Move over to the Giants backfield. Through three games, no running back on the Giants have surpassed 28 yards on the ground. That was the best game from a running back so far. It was Shane Vereen in week two versus Detroit. They are something awful over there. The team is tied for fourth worst in the NFL, averaging 3.1 yards per carry, and they're dead last rushing for 48.7 yards per game. The next closest team on a yards per game basis is Arizona, averaging 64 yards per game. So almost a full 16 yards more on the ground per game than the Giants who are dead last. I don't want any part of any part of that backfield. Move over to Philadelphia. We saw Darren Sproles go down with that broken arm. Somehow he ended up with a broken arm and a torn ACL on the same play. Like, what do you do in that situation? You know, like, do you grab your knee? Do you grab your arm? I feel like I would just pass away. I'm dead. Look at what this Philly team has been doing on offense. They rank 13th in the NFL with 80 rushing attempts on the year and they also rank fourth in the NFL in pass attempts with 116 through three games so they're just a team that is high volume on offense whether it's rushing it whether it's passing the ball. Philly running backs have only seen 20 of the uh, 118 targets that Wentz has thrown so far which is just 17 percent so Sproles is out right and, and you're kind of like trying to you know do I want LeGarrette Blunt? do I want Wendell Smallwood either way they're not really using the backs that much in in the back field. Smallwood has three catches on five targets for only 11 yards. Blunt has one yard on, on two targets, two catches. So none of, neither of them are going to be Sproles. They're not going to put up the production he has. But of course, Sproles' carries are going to be split amongst the two. And I'm sure their targets will probably more so go towards uh, Smallwood. I, I feel like they're going to go back and forth probably. Like Eric Blunt is probably the play in standard because he's going to get the goal line rushes. But Smallwood probably is a preferred back in PPR. And they also have Corey Clement who got in on some plays last game. He scored a touchdown. So it's going to be an R RBBC for sure, for sure least. But it's hard to really pinpoint who you want. I guess if I wanted someone in the backfield, it would be Smallwood just because he gives you that passing game upside now that Sproles is gone. But I probably wouldn't look at either of them as more than a flex play. Moving over to the Saints. I tweeted about this stat earlier today. So far in 2017, Mark Ingram has 46% of the uh, the Saints' entire backfield touches, and he's accounted for 52% of the backfield's total yardage. You look at 2016, he had 50% of their total touches, 50.4%, and 53% of their running back's total yardage. So it's almost similar, right? You've seen 4% less touches, almost identical, 53 to 52% of their total yardage. So the difference here is the touchdown total, right? And actually, I would see those touches kind of rise. I think they'll use Ingram more in the in the run game as we've seen Adrian Peterson struggle a little bit. Ingram scored 10 touchdowns last year, right? And he has yet to score, score a touchdown in 2017. He does lead the team, rushes inside the five yard line. He has three of them through three games. So he's getting on average a goal line rush per game. So I would expect him to eventually start scoring the ball, maybe end up with between six, seven, ish touchdowns on the year with around the same amount of yards he had last year 12 to 1300 yards so ingram i'll touch on i'll touch on him more in like my buy low section of my my week four video but he's one of he's a guy i'm probably targeting for uh on, on the low low moving over to carolina between c mac and jonathan stewart so we've seen c mac kind of dominate in his backfield in terms of play time he's been in on 66 percent of their snaps so far this year jonathan stewart only 42 percent of their snaps but stewart is dominating carries right they don't even mccaffrey's looked really bad in between the tackles this year as a runner and carolina is clearly not looking to use him there stewart has 62 percent of the carolina running backs carries c mac has 82 percent of the running back targets and actually 25 and a half percent of the entire team's targets. so you got greg olson down we don't know the extent of kelvin benjamin's injury, but it looks like it could be somewhere from like one to four weeks if I had to guess right now. So C-Mac again is, is a pretty safe, he's, he's a high floor uh, PPR play at running back, but he's not getting the carry. So I'm probably a little more skeptical about him in standard. I mean, obviously, but looking at some of Cam Newton's numbers, I tweeted this out also today. Yeah. If you're not following me on Twitter, make sure you're doing that. Cause I just, I'll just tweet out like random stats all, all motherfucking day. So I was looking at like Cam Newton as a passer because McGaffrey's taking up such a big number of their targets and their touches. So I wanted to see Cam, right? His average depth of target so far is 8.4 yards, which is 20th in the NFL amongst quarterbacks. Last year, in 2016, Cam was first in the NFL, averaging 11 yards uh, per target. 2015, he was second in the NFL, 10.9 yards. So you see a dramatic, it's almost three yards per target difference now that he's targeting C-Mac a ton. So 
This is, you know, without the weapons, obviously, without Olsen and maybe Benjamin, Cam is like, I fucking started him over Drew Brees in one of my leagues. But Cam is basically droppable in 10 team leagues because he's just not putting up the yardage totals that he can be. And they're just relying on these short dump off games and stuff. So looking at Baltimore. We got Buck Allen, we got Terrence West. Now we got Alex Collins. And I talked about this in my video last week. I was like, I like Buck Allen's situation, but I'm still very skeptical on how I wanna proceed with him, right? People are like, oh, he's a bona fide RB2 going forward. I was curious about that, right? He, he dominated snaps again in this game, but that's probably only because he's their preferred pass catching back and they were getting their asses whooped in London, right? He had 53% of the snaps. Alex Collins actually outsnapped Terrence West 18% to 16%. But I'm looking at Buck Allen, right, as an actual running back. If you take away that 37 yard run at the end of week two, where it was a wide open, was a wide open hole, right, and untouched, Allen's averaging 2.67 yards per carry on 42 carries. And among 26 running backs in the NFL that have played on at least 50% of their team snaps, Allen ranks 23rd out of 26 in yards per reception at 4.8. So he's basically he's capable of catching the ball, right? He's the preferred pass catching back meaning he's literally capable of catching the ball, but he doesn't do much with it, right? 4.8 yards per reception is not getting you much. Alex Collins, on the other hand, is someone I want to talk about. He is buried under Buck Allen and Terrence West, but he has looked very good this year. Alex Collins is 124 rushing yards on 16 attempts on the year, 7.8 yards per carry. I know that's a ridiculously small sample size, but so far in his career, he's averaging 5.3 yards per carry on 47 attempts. Collins just turned 23 years old, right? He was one of those running backs that that Seattle drafted last year. And they drafted a bunch of guys, right? They drafted CJ Procyce, they drafted, they drafted like three or four guys, right? And I guess Alex Collins, they didn't really have a role for him yet between Thomas Roll, CJ Procyce, and like whatever they had going last year. But he's still super young, right? 23 years old. Look back at his junior year in 2015 before he came out at Arkansas. He ran for 1,570, almost 1,600 yards, 5.8 yards per carry, and scored 20 touchdowns on the year. So Collins is more than capable of handling a big workload. He's on the smaller side, so I doubt they use him. And Terrence West is probably the guy who's going to get most of the early down work. But Collins is a guy to keep an eye out for if you're in deeper leagues. Because on an efficiency standpoint, he's been way more efficient so far this year on a small sample size than Buck Allen and Terrence West. But I like what I've seen from Collins so far and nothing in his background makes me say like, oh, why, you know, why did he drop? I think he was a sixth or seventh round pick for Seattle, but I just think he's someone to definitely keep an eye on if he keeps his kind of play up. Moving over to Washington, Samaj P. Ryan. They're just going to keep feeding him the ball. I'm, I don't know what they're doing. I mean, I guess they won, so it is what it is. But on the season, he has 116 rushing yards on 40 carries, which is 2.9 yards per carry. He hasn't looked good this week. He didn't look good last week. You look at all the other running backs on the team have combined for 254 yards on 42 carries. So two carries more than P. Ryan, but 140 yards more. That's 6.0 yards per carry for every running back not named Samaji P. Ryan. And I know you could be like, oh, Chris Thompson keeps busting out big plays, but it's not none of the other running backs, Rob Kelly, Brown, or uh, Chris Thompson, average less than 5.5 4.5 yards per carry so i think what we're saying here is p ryan is is the sore thumb that's sticking out here now we got to talk about chris thompson of course uh he had eight career touchdowns coming into 2017 so 2014 15 16 three years he had eight total touchdowns through three games already he has four he's averaging a touchdown every 6.75 touches I don't need to sit here and tell you that he can't keep that up, of course, but he has looked like by far the best player on the Redskins this year. What I will say is still very small sample size. He only has 27 touches on the year. He doesn't have a single, according to PFF, he doesn't have a single tackle avoided on his 14 carries. In terms of yards after contact, he ranks 49th out of 57 qualified running backs with more than 10 carries, according to PFF. Just 1.9 yards after contact. We know he's not the in-between tackle kind of guy, but it's just going to show you, you know, like while he might keep seeing increased touches, right? His PPR floor is nice, but like Jay Gruden said, they don't want to feed him so much work because he is smaller. As you can see, he's not great at running between the tackles. He's not great at getting yards after contact because of his small size, but he's explosive. He looks really good. He's definitely one of the top waiver wire pickups this year, this week in, in PPR leagues. But again, I'm not going crazy over Chris Thompson because his efficiency numbers are just like they're ridiculous. Moving on to Cincinnati, their first game under the new OC, Bill Lazier. We saw Mixon basically get a featured workload here. What I will say though, Gio still leads the backfield in snaps on the year. He's getting about 41% of the snaps, but he's actually third in total touches. Mixon has 42, Jeremy Hill is 22, and Gio only has 20. But Gio leads uh, Cincinnati backfield in yards per carry, 5.1, yards after contact average, 3.4, 
tackles avoided per attempt, total targets, and total standard fantasy points, despite seeing 22 less touches than Mixon. So on an efficiency level, Geo is easily the best back that they've had right now. But if there's going to be one who takes over the backfield, of course, it's going to be Mixon, given his receiving ability, size, speed, all that stuff. Basically, this is exactly how we figured this was going to go, right? It would take Mixon about three or four weeks to get into that big workload. And we saw it yesterday at 19, I think it was 19 carries, 22 total touches, which was good to see. And it kept them in the game. So if they want to stay in the game against a team like the Packers, maybe that's what they need to keep doing going forward. So it was definitely good to see what Mixon. And guys, all these stats I'm breaking down for you are not like, I'm not saying like, oh, I want Geo's the back to own there. I'm just giving you the numbers and you guys can do the analysis on it if you want. Mixon clearly like a, a really good buy low candidate, even though his buy low window is probably shut now. Um, but good things ahead for Mixon in terms of usage at least. And I think we got three more backfields. We got Tennessee where Murray and Henry are splitting work, both averaging over five yards per carry. So both looking really good. Murray has dominated snaps playing in almost 65% of the snaps. Henry just 36%. Where they differ though, Henry is averaging 3.2 yards after contact, which is tied for sixth in the entire NFL among running backs with at least 12 carries, while Murray is averaging just 1.8 yards after contact, which is tied for 44th among 48 running backs. He's kind of looked sluggish too. He's not really making anything happen besides the big run he had yesterday. I know he had that 75-yard touchdown run. You're like, what hamstring muff? But it's clear that, you know, the Titans are not going away from Murray. So anyone who thought they had Henry as like an elite RB1 following last week, Murray's obviously healthier than a lot of people expected, and they're still going to be splitting work. So their next three games, they play they play Houston in week four, but after Houston, they play Miami, Indianapolis, and Cleveland. Seems like an easy slate, but listen, like I've said plenty of times before, you don't really know a team until you're about five or six weeks into the season. So far through three weeks, Miami, Cleveland, and Indy all rank in the top eight in rush defense in terms of yards per carry, all allowing 3.3 yards per carry or less. They might be a lot better at run D than we think. I mean, they've each had easy matchups so far, so we still don't know. Like I said, you need to see like five or six games before you really, really know a team. But what I would say is Murray is still dominating in passing work, still getting plenty of carries, snaps, touches. So Murray is definitely still the back to own here, but it's looking more and more like they're going to be splitting the workload like 55 to 45 in Murray's favor. I'm probably holding on to Murray unless I get a really good deal on him. Like if someone's like, if someone saw last game and they're like, oh, Murray, you know, looked amazing. I'd probably sell Murray if it's at the right price point. So let me th let me think of some guys I would give Murray up for. I would definitely take, I don't know if these are reasonable. These are off the top of my head. I would take Stefan Diggs for Murray. I'd probably still take Murray over CJ Anderson because we saw what might happen in games, right? CJ Anderson didn't get a lot of touches yesterday. Jamal Charles looked just as good as him. Uh, CJ Anderson still definitely the back to own, but game script might kill him. Whereas Murray will play rushing downs and passing down and late in the game and stuff like that. So I don't know. I mean, you can you can comment down below. Like it, you could ask me, would you take Murray over blah, 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 and make sure you put the league type like standard PPR, but I'm not like totally down on Murray. Then we have the New York Jets. Gang green. Gang, 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 gang. Uh, so Matt Forte left their, their game with uh, with a toe injury. A little toe, little, little toe guy. And uh, supposedly he was seen on the sidelines later in the game looking spry or whatever. I don't know. Roto World Blurb said that he looked fine and he looked okay. We don't know the severity of the severity of the injury. He's played in the most snaps this year for the Jets, 47% of their snaps. Powell's 41%. And now you have Elijah Maguire at 14%. But when you're looking at just weeks two and three, right? Maguire was not really involved at all in week one. So two and three is probably a better sample size. We have Maguire playing 21% of the snaps, Powell 36%. Forte, 40%. That also includes Forte basically not playing at all in the second half on Sunday. And over that span, we have Powell getting 38% of their running back touches, Forte, 36%, Maguire, 25%. Although, I'll say this. So Forte's got the toe injury. We don't know how serious it is. Maguire fumbled in the fourth quarter yesterday while they're trying to put the game away. So that could scare away the coaches, especially a young back like Maguire, who's a rookie. The Jets get Jacksonville, and then they get Cleveland over the next two games. So depending on Forte's status, Powell might be like a very highly owned player in like DFS, I guess. Jacksonville, surprisingly on the year, they've allowed 4.8 yards per carry and over 135 rushing yards per game to opponents this year. Over the first three weeks so far of the season, the Jets running back position has seen on average 25 touches. So not like the RB1, but overall between McGuire, Forte, Powell, receptions and carries on average 25 touches 
in each game. I think it was like 21, 25, and 29. So they're seeing around like the mid 20s is something you could expect. But again, that'll probably be split up. If Forte's gone, it'll be maybe 17 touches Powell and eight touches for McGuire or something like that. And they're really not targeting their running backs much. They have 86 pass attempts on the year. Running backs have combined for 17 targets. On a combined 15 targets, Forte and Powell have dropped four of them. So they're not really helping out there in what should be like a strength of, of their running backs. So Powell's definitely a hold for now until we know more about, you know, Forte's situation. But I'm not like super excited to get him to my lineup by any means. In Seattle, we got my boy Chris Carson. In Lacey nor Thomas Rawls, neither of them got a touch in week three. So I think that gives you a pretty good look at exactly what Pete Carroll sees when he looks at the backfield. Carson has played on 56% of Seattle snaps so far in the year. CJ Procise is the next closest back, playing on only 29% of their on their snaps. And we're looking at Carson on the year so far, among backs with more than 15 carries. So that's you know, that's just five carries per game. So it's still a lot of running back. Carson ranks 10th in yards per carry, 4.5, fifth in tackles avoided per attempt. And he's caught all four of his targets for 35 yards and a touchdown. You see he's doing it all. He's making guys miss. He's he's racking up a good 4.5 yards per carry is really impressive behind that offensive line in Seattle. So Carson looks like the real deal. He looks like he's almost pretty much a locked in RB2 going forward. He plays the Colts at home in week 14, in week four. Seattle's a 13 and a half point favorite. So Carson is a must start for me in week four. I could see him at, if they get up big, I could definitely see him getting like 18 plus touches, 15 catches carries, 16, 17, 18 carries, and then a couple of receptions. So love Carson going into week four. Love him for the rest of the season as well. And that basically wraps up this kind of video. Again, I don't know if I'm going to make this video every week or not. I will put out the blog every week. So make sure you subscribe to that again. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed. Leave any questions, comments, whatever you want to do down below. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We'll be coming out with videos every single week as well as the podcast with fantasy football advice. Live stream on YouTube on Sunday. So make sure that you have the notifications on. Just hit that little bell underneath this video. So you know when I hop on the live stream. I'll do it randomly throughout the week sometimes too. I did it a couple times this week. That's that, and I'll see you all in the next episode.